Hello, family. I'm Robin. I'm a real alcoholic. Hey, Robin. Hey, Robin. I'd like to welcome everyone to the Atlanta Step Up Society book study. Mm -hmm. Change your thinking, change your life. Let's open with a moment of silence, followed by the serenity prayer. Serenity prayer. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things that I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. All right, we're, we're in the chapter Two Wives, and I looked on the internet today, and we had a lot of people around the world log in or click on the YouTube and watch this, uh, the last week's, you know, class. And I, I'm really grateful for that because my vision, and we're going to read the chapter on visions, the two visions, is that kind of like the founders of AA, I want everybody on the planet who's seeking recovery or seeking AA to at least have an opportunity to hear the book broken down paragraph by paragraph. And to me, that would be an honor. That would be an honor. That's a great honor. That's a spiritual honor for me to be able to do this. So I feel honored to be able to do it. And the chapter two wise is a real fascinating chapter because I really never, in 20 years, I really never broke it down like that. I kind of like ran through it real fast to get to the next chapter, the family. And the family afterwards is real deep too. But I think that more and more people are realizing how important it is to return back to our families. You know, we was talking about the veterans. You know, one of our diseases and, and, and one of our elements or character defects of being an alcoholic or an addict is that we do withdraw from society. Right. Mm -hmm. We withdraw from society and hopefully we're going to get to that tonight. And the veterans are coming home, and when they get back, they probably will feel less than what they felt in the military. So they will start withdrawing. And it's my duty and the duty to the rest of the veterans is to make sure we don't lose people when we can grab them before that happens, and let's try to make them quickly as possible back into being productive members of society. A man or a woman, I don't know how far you can go being clean and sober in the beginning when you don't have nothing to feel good about. You're already depressed from your past life. Then you come into recovery and you depressed again. We need to kind of find a way to eliminate that. And one of the best ways to do it is to really, if you join a book study, that's a big step for your morale to be a member to say I go to this group and we study the book you know I, 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 maybe a little ego play I don't know and we doing this every week and we learning it what you learning and if they can't answer you feel good because you know you're on the right track because the information in this book is invaluable to any person that reads it it's invaluable I kind of feel sorry for people in recovery who don't read it who don't study this. I mean, personally, I don't even know how, how you can stay clean and so It's just too much information for your own personal life to sit around and ignore it. And then say, I'm a member of AA. Yeah, you are. In the fellowship. If you're not a member of this program. <laughs> All right, let's go to the page 112. They were giving the wives some suggestions on how to deal with their husbands. And now they're getting to more, their husbands that more seriously alcoholic. <clears throat> so we start right here with suppose, however, that your husband fits the description of number two. You want to start there, Paul? Y'all see that? Everybody see that? The chances um, are he would. Suppose, I want to start right there. On one twelve. Oh, oh, paragraph okay. Above okay. Suppose, however, that your husband fits the description of number two. The same principles would apply to husband number one should be practiced, but after his next binge, ask him if he would really like to get over drinking for good. 
Do not ask that he do it for you or anyone else. Just would he like to. Remember last week I was talking about, you know, husband number two, he's kind of getting out of control with his drinking. All right. But he has not gotten to the point where he realized that alcohol is a serious problem to him. He might still have his family, he might still have his job, but it's out of control a little bit. And then it says right here, that the suggestion that I wanted to focus on tonight was, but after his next binge, y'all see that? Ask him if he would really like to get over drinking for good. Do not ask that he do it for you or anyone else. Just would he like to. I kind of like that approach because when I was getting um, out of control or my life was, alcohol was taking it to the left or making it worse, and especially for the people around me, I found that nobody was giving me any encouragement to try to get clean and sober. They were calling me stuff like, you're a demon, you got the devil in you, you ain't gonna be nothing like this, alcohol gonna destroy everything you got. So the more negative things I heard about my drinking, the more resentments I end up getting. So, the book says all that does by me being angry or alcoholic being angry because you putting pressure on him to get treatment or, or get clean and sober or stop drinking, it just prolongs the drinking. There's no reason because I'm always pissed off and if I'm always angry about something, well, for me, if you make me mad, I show you, I go make myself feel worse than I already do. I never looked at what part I played. And people, and someone who doesn't look at what part they play, when you hear other people criticizing you, that just makes it worse. Because I don't want to see the truth in me. I be H-E-L-L, -L, I'm going to allow you to see it. <laughs> that makes sense? Some people, we can never change some people by criticizing them. You got to show them some kind of love. And that's what it says right here, would you like to? Uh, would you really like to get over drinking for good? They're kind of being polite about it. I think that's, for me, that's a better approach. All right, the next one. The chances are he would. Show him your copy of this book and tell him what you have found out about alcoholism. Show him that as alcoholics, the writers of this book understand. Tell him some of the interesting stories you have read. If you think he will be shy of a spiritual remedy, ask him to look at the chapter on alcoholism. Then perhaps he will be interested enough to continue. The chances are he would. Would you like to be clean and sober? Would you like to stop drinking? The chances are he would. Then he says, this is what I like. Show him your copy of this book. That means that the wives of the alcoholics have their own personal copy of the big book. The big book. I go to meeting today, and this is not al meeting. I don't. I go to very few al meetings. I go to the real AA meetings, you know, I'm not saying they're not real, but AA meetings, and I see people in our fellowship who don't own a copy of the AA book. Show them a copy of, of your, your copy of the book and tell them what you have found out about alcoholism. That means that the women in those days that was concerned about the husband had their own copy of the big book. They also studied the doctor's opinion because if you're going to tell them what you know about alcoholism, you had definitely had to read the doctor's opinion and more about alcoholism. They were able to tell them about the mental obsession and the physical uh, uh, allergy, the craving, how it affects the mind and the body. If the obsession to tell you to take a drink and once you put any alcohol into your body, it triggers the phenomenon of craving. And once you start craving, the craving is beyond your mental control. What it's really telling you is that once you start craving, your mind cannot stop you from craving. Mm -hmm. It can't say, whoa, you know, you, you're craving now, you need to stop. 
and go on and do about face and go do the right things that you promised you were going to do. Your mind has, has no control over stopping you once the allergy triggers in. That's what render us powerless. That's what makes us powerless. If once I put any alcohol into my body, the allergy triggers, the phenomenal craving, my body starts craving more, I have to chase the craving, even if my mind told me, don't you know your mother just passed? They have a wait tonight for her. You're supposed to be at the wait. I'm chasing the craving. I miss the wait, the funeral, and everything. Because I'm powerless. My mind can't stop me from craving. The wives of alcoholics knew this because they studied the book that they had, they owned, and they spoke to other alcoholic, uh, uh, you know, wives, the wives of alcoholics. So they understood this. So if they could do it then, why is our message so diluted today that we got people in whole treatment centers never heard of this stuff? Think about that. <laughs> Show him that as alcoholics, the writers of this book understand. One addict or alcoholic helping another. We wrote a book because we understand you so well that we're going to tell you what we went through is the same as what you're going through. Tell him some of the interesting stories you have read in the back of the book. Be your story in the front. Stories in the back. If you think he will be shy of a spiritual remedy, ask him to look at the chapter on alcoholism. Perhaps he will be interested enough to continue. Let's talk about spiritual remedy. Well, let's look at the word remedy. I'm not even going to go all into spiritual depths because spirituality is all-inclusive. It's very, very all-inclusive. And what we mean by that is, if, if let's say all-inclusive. If I, I learned all-inclusive the hard way. The hard way. Me and my wife took, one, one day I was in the office. We had about, the company about two years. And I was sitting in there. And by me being in the military, I remembered all the traveling that I used to do. You know. So I was sitting in the office and I said, yo, let's go to Jamaica. She said, when? I said, I'm going to get on the internet and call, call somebody right now. We can go this weekend. Got on the phone, looked up some places, uh, found this Jamaican tourist company, called them up, gave my credit card. I had a passport. I already had my passport. No, you didn't even need passports then. All you needed was your ID card, your driving license. Flew to Jamaica. Just went on the internet, found a spot. Uh, right outside the Montego Bay, Wyndham Hall, flew over there, got there. So when we checked in, I was already prepaid. But the, the resort had everything, boat ride and fishing ride tours, and, you know, all this, and food and restaurants, 10 restaurants, it was gorgeous. But these people were running around with their little armbands on. Right? You know, little like a little medical looking thing, like going to the hospital, right? Different color, red, purple, you know, yellow. I didn't have one. They didn't give me one when I checked in. So I'm going around and I asked some people, well, what are those? I said, we're all inclusive. I said, what does that mean? That means we pay one price, we can do everything on here, all we want, as many times we want, and don't have to pay no more money. Every time I sell at a restaurant, $100. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Reference, $50. Watch TV, movie, $25. And forget about trying to take one of them tours. You know, the fishing tour, that's $300. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm trying to say? The snorkeling, $500. Uh, the dinner ride, I couldn't do none of that. Because I wasn't all-inclusive. The genius that I am, I go back up there when I start kind of figuring out what was going on with the all-inclusive. I go back up there and say, look, I want to change my plan. <laughs> I want it all-inclusive. They said, no, you can't do that. You pray, pay this way, you got to stay this way. Never again. I have never taken another trip abroad without being all inclusive. That makes no sense. And it's about a hundred dollar more than the whole package I paid. <laughs> that makes no sense. So spirituality is the same thing. You can have access to it all if you open your mind. 
Well, you can walk around like me and get in a little corner of it. Well, this little corner up here, and then when it gets too tough, you can't go nowhere. You just stuck. So when we say a spiritual remedy, that means that we have something that's spiritual that not only will work for us, it'll work for anybody. And you can take it to any strength you want, any length you want. Like me, myself, I, um, I'm a 12-stepper. But... Came to believe in a power greater than myself. I'm re I really take that to a sense that that power is now me. But the the uh, some step I do way more than I do others. That makes sense. Like the, the uh, prayer meditation, the eleven step. That's me. I live in that one, and it has gotten me so far that if if, if anything has to to improve my meditating or my imagination or my vision any part of this this whole planet that has anything to do with that I'm open I, I, I could do that forever I could just sit on a mountain and meditate and everything Russell Simmons got a new book uh, Success Through Meditating oh man Wayne we're the, I was the first to click on that bang got to have it I believe in it I believe it. I believe in that internal peace. I believe in it. Sometimes you see me at lack of food, park eight, but most of the time I'm not. I walk by situations like they don't even bother me. Like I'm not even on this planet. People be talking about money problems and all that. Ain't nobody in this room got no more bills than me. So when I hear other people talking about bills, that makes no sense. This the bill master. <laughs> what the hell are you talking about? <laughs> There's something broke. That's what I got. You know what I'm saying? If I got all these bills and, and this and that, and I don't have to worry about it. I don't know what the hell you worried about. <laughs> it, that, they're not important. What's important is your internal peace. Relax your mind. Go inside. Grab that creative force, that power that's in us. The same power. I tell women all the time, y'all should really know this one. If you had a baby, that same creative power that created that baby in you is the same power that created all the galaxies, all the stars, all the billions and billions and billions of galaxies, infinite. The same power that did the baby. <laughs> so why are you looking outside for the power? <laughs> it's in us. See, that's my spirituality. Some people ain't that. Your spirituality you might be just doing the names on the four step. <laughs> Do that. Yeah. Get, be so spiritual that you can let go of the resentment that you've been carrying for years. Resentment against Vietnam. Mm -hmm. Resentment against this. Resentment against the military. They ain't gonna get you nowhere. But resentment don't do nothing but block the spirituality. Mm -hmm. That's why they say do it. Mm -hmm. Get past that stuff. Become free. Happy, joyous, and free. So that's spirituality. So now let me let me break it back down. It said right here, if you think he will be shy of a spiritual remedy. Now let's look at the word remedy. Remedy, this is Webster. A medicine, application, or treatment that relieves or cures a disease. So what they're saying is that, okay, if, if you had a non-spiritual remedy for to cure alcoholism, you let's I'm gonna use something. I, I'm just gonna break out of alcohol for a minute. I wanna use crack. But we're talking about alcohol too, because I wanna reach everybody. That's okay, y'all y'all permit that? Yes. Oh, yeah. I don't care if you did or not, so <laughs> I'll be trying to be proud of formality. <laughs> if if you are a crack addict or an alcoholic and you are really blown full addict, we have tried non-spiritual remedies, treatments. We have tried application. I ain't talking about treatment centers because they swing over into like spirituality. So a non a non spiritual remedy. Right, and that's a medicine or application or something like that. Well, but like, let me walk up to the doctor because I am skid roll bomb, alcoholic, crack addict, been homeless for 10 years, 
can't come up out this stuff. Look like uh, uh, Chris Tucker did in what was it, the movie with uh, New Jack City, mm -hmm. you know? Right. What was his name in there? Rock. Pookie. Uh, Pookie. Chris Rock. Yeah. Pookie. 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 You looking like Pookie. Mm -hmm. Down <laughs> in the, under the ground. You know, they were getting high down up under that, yeah. that dungeon. Can you walk up out of there and go to a doctor? This would be a non-spiritual remedy. Out. Go to a doctor and say, look, doc. I've been suffering from this disease of addiction and crack and alcohol for 10 years. Can I get a shot to make me stop? Do you got any kind of syrup or juice I can drink to make me stop? What's the answer? No. So that would be a non-spiritual remedy. You know what I'm saying? Go, you've been on crack like that for 10 years, I'm just going to stop and go live with grandmama in the country. Leave the city. I'm gonna go through the country, but they don't have that with the cows and the chickens and you know. And I'm gonna milk cows for the rest of my life. When you get to the country, you gonna be able to stop? Nope. No. Nope. That will be a non-spiritual yeah. remedy. Mm -hmm. Y'all, getting it now? Mm -hmm. You can't go to the doctor and get no shot. There's no shot for this one. So they said that a spiritual remedy. We got to have something spiritual that's gonna awaken us on the inside to make us not do this stuff. And the best spiritual program on the planet is the 12 steps. There's no better spiritual remedy. It takes care of the bulk of your resentments, right or wrong? It has you to believe in a power that's greater than you. Then it turns around and asks you to do a confession of your sins or your wrongs. Get it all out in the open. Free yourself. Then you turn around to all the business acquaintances and the friends and your family and all the people that you have wronged. You turn around and you make amends to them. You tell them that you're sorry. Then when you get all this freedom and you start enjoying your life and everything, you turn right back and you continue to watch, watch for this stuff to crop up in your life and you relieve it. Then you turn right around and you start giving back, helping other people to become clean and sober with the same spiritual process that you did. And you become happy, joyous, and free. Free of uh, promises to kick in. Economic insecurity will leave you. Feel people and all this kind of stuff will go. Then you enter the field or the sixth dimension that they talk about. There's five senses, but we have a sixth dimension, a sixth sense. Where you enter the field of unlimited, infinite possibilities. There's nothing can stop you from being what you wanted to be, but you. The worst thing I can tell people, this is me, is to think little and accomplish it. <laughs> Let me say that again. That went on people's head. <laughs> Worst thing you can do is to think small or little and achieve it. Yeah. What did you do? Yeah. You just got a little bit, a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> Try yourself. Put your imagination out there. Think of something big and become it. There's nothing wrong with that. Even if you got halfway there, you better than the little bit you just thought about. And you accomplish, that's not spiritual. Spirituality is to be able to come up with something in your mind that's big and give it a chance. Allow it to happen. Allow it to happen. Friend was telling me that she made two B's and she had a lot of new stuff coming into her life in, in the finals. A lot of new stuff. And I'm like, wow, that's fantastic. If people made C's and D's in that class that had nothing going on. Think about it. They thought little. This person got everything they wanted and still got good grades. You got to think big. Well, you don't have to. But that would be a spiritual challenge. I challenge anybody. If you're an alcoholic and you're drinking and you're using right now, think big. Think of a clean, sober experience. If you haven't been to, let's say, a lot of alcoholics, we don't go home. You know, we go into a city and we get stuck on alcohol 
and we stay there, but we always want to return back to our family that still exists. Think big. See yourself clean and sober. Them hugging you, you hugging them. If you haven't talked to your kids, I see tears, but uh, I mean, this is real. If you haven't communicated with them the way you should, start communicating with them tonight. You don't have to talk to them to communicate with them. You can go to bed tonight and have a decent conversation with your daughter and your son. You can, you can go and fall asleep in a matter of time that you would have that conversation. It will come alive in your life. You don't have to wait. What you waiting on? Do it at night before you fall asleep. When I go to a meeting, any meeting I go to, I don't care where it is, I have a meeting tomorrow. Tonight, I'll meddle myself down to the alpha level. I'll talk about that later. <laughs> go down where the spiritual world exists. I will go in there. I will create the meeting like I want it to be tomorrow. But all for the good. The person I'm talking to, he's going to know that I am being 100% truthful and that I can help him. Expand his vision too. That makes sense. Yes, sir. Both of us can work together in honesty to do better for mankind. I would create that in my mind tonight and fall asleep with it. And I use my little finger like this. I'll go in and meet tomorrow. This is no. I'm telling you. I'll go in and meet tomorrow. We'll be talking. I'll say, Bing, <laughs> <laughs> Bing, <laughs> I got him. <laughs> Soon as I do this, boop, we own what I just did last night. Let's get out of here, Mr. Baba. My point is this. We all have the power in it, but we haven't been taught how to use it. Communication, we talk about communication. That's why I love to do this, because somebody in the world needed to hear what I just said. They're going to a meeting tomorrow. And they need this advice tonight. See, communication is only a small percentage of how we really communicate. If you can hear my voice, I'm the transmitter right now. So everybody in here is the perceiver. You're perceiving what I'm saying. That's only 3% of communicating. Mm -hmm. The rest of the communication is done in how you're going to feel about it. Mm -hmm. When you leave here tonight, what you're going to take with you. What you gonna listen? What you what, what 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 that made sense. I see it don't have to be me. Wow, what he read in that book, what we studied tonight, that made sense. And you dwell on that. Now you communicate <laughs> with yourself. He got nothing to do with talking to me. <laughs> with the spirit that's in you. That makes sense. Yes. So you do that, right? So in the spiritual world, that's the objective world. That's the world we see right here. I told you nothing comes into this presence. Without being in the human imagination first. No fan, no chair, no rug, no glasses, nothing. It all came from us. In the spiritual world, in the spiritual world, when we see a vision, when you got a vision, that means you've already seen it before. You know what I'm trying to say? Like if you have a vision or something, that means you've already seen it before. That's perception. The transmitter is your imagination, which you have not seen. That makes sense? So you go into your imagination, create, if you need a new house, a new car, go in tonight and drive the car in your imagination. Look at, and be careful to look at colors. I like that one. Mm -hmm. Smell the seat. Wow, it smells good. Feel it. Go in there and do it. That's in your imagination. Your imagination transmit that information to your vision and then it objectifies in the world. Never fails. That's in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. The earth was without void. This is it. This is the creative spirituality that comes from doing the 12 step. The 12 step opens up the door. That makes sense. Removes the chaos so you can improve your life.
Somebody, if you ain't get it in here, somebody got it. And it's okay. So, we go right here, it says, perhaps he will be interest, interested enough to continue. Let's go on to another paragraph. <clears throat> if he is enthusiastic. If he is enthusiastic, your cooperation will mean a great deal. If he is lukewarm or thinks he is not an alcoholic, we suggest you leave him alone. Avoid urging him to follow our, pro our program. The seed has been planted in his mind. He knows that thousands of men, much like himself, have recovered. But don't remind him of this after he has been drinking, or he may be angry. Sooner or later, you are likely to find him reading the book once more. Wait until a repeated stumbling convinces him he must act. For the more you hurry him, the longer his recovery may be delayed. If he is enthusiastic, your cooperation will mean a great deal. When you are cooperating with him, you know, telling the women that you're telling them about what you learned about alcoholism and stuff, kind of read the book, here's my book. You're not saying, here's, get, read this book, I got that book for you, you're drunk, you need to read this. They're not saying that. They're saying, this is my book, I read it. Would you like to have some of this information? You know what I'm trying to say? They're more polite than what we got. All right. So it says that if he is lukewarm or thinks he is not an alcoholic, we suggest you leave him alone. Avoid urging him to follow our program. We never make nobody do this. Never. I don't do that no more. I used to try in the beginning and I found out it did not work, so I stopped. I give the message. If you like what we have, you're welcome to stay. If you're not, you're welcome to go. But you're going to get promise and rewards if you stay. And you'll get promise and rewards if you go. Doesn't matter. The seed has been planted in his mind. That's where the spirituality that we talk about, when we say, look inside, it's in your mind. And even to think about God, you have to use your mind. There's no other way you can come up with a conception of God unless it's in your mind. There's no other way. There's no other way you come up with a conception of the devil. It's in your mind too. You can choose which one you want to follow. It's both in your mind. You can believe in the devil. Way more. Now I have done that. So don't nobody look at me strange. I knew more about the devil than I do God. I did God. But I heard out the devil so much that I had this whole concept of the devil. And they asked me about God, he's out there. That's all I knew. In heaven somewhere. But I can tell you everything about being a demon. And it was all in where? My mind. My perception. He knows that thousands of men such like himself have recovered. That's deep. We go and we tell people, you know, it's you 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 drinking. But I know thousands of men, and I can honestly say that today. That have recovered, changed their life, even coming through our program, changed their life, and are very, very productive members of society today. I could tell them that, right? That would plant a seed in their mind. That right then and there opens someone's imagination. That makes sense? If you're using it, somebody tell you that thousands, they know thousands of people have recovered. And you at the point where you know you need to quit and your life is in shambles and totally unmanageable, that was stick in my mind. Because nobody told me there were thousands of people that did recover. Mm -hmm. When I first attempted to recover, I told y'all I went to the Holly Club a few times and across the street was the fire barrel where everybody got drunk. And I went, I left the fire barrel. Stayed over on that side of the street, went to the Holland Club about a week, you know, and, and went to a shelter. And I refused to go over to the street, or across the street where they were. I saw them, I weighed them, and kept on going. God was determined to get clean and sober. Then when I did go over there, I didn't have no intention of drinking. That's why they say don't go. You know, I didn't have no intention of drinking, but they told me over there that what you're doing over there don't work. Don't you see it? We've been over there too. <laughs> so I believe in them, let's go back drinking. <laughs> Then after I got really got into recovery years later, I realized that the people who told me that at the five were relapses. Right. I believed them. 
So there's thousands of people who have millions now who have recovered. So if you're an alcoholic and you feel like, man, there's millions of people who have done this, why not me? People all the time, we just change our perception. People all the time tell me about cars. I hear this all the time. I sure need to buy me a car. What's the problem? I don't know if I can get one. We live in Atlanta. If you ever look, what, the last, what, a month ago when we had that ice storm? It was more cars stuck than I ever seen in my life. Stuck. If all them people can have a car, why can't I? It was my thinking. I believe I couldn't do it. People talking about I can't buy a house. Do you see how many abandoned houses mm -hmm. is in this city? Mm -hmm. That makes no sense. You all you have to do is knock on the right bank. Mm -hmm. And my credit get bad, but it's better than that one that you just closed down. <laughs> <laughs> I got I can pay. I got a job. They gonna open the door to you. Somebody will. Mm -hmm. There's people out here that bought up big neighborhoods that would love mm -hmm. to have you. Contact them and say, you see that abandoned house that the city keep riding by with them code enforcement mm -hmm. tagging on that door every day? Let me occupy it. I'll pay you some rent. They'll open up the door for you. I know I would. How do I know that? That's how I got this building. It was condemned. I knocked on the lady's door and she started crying because they were coding up. She was grateful. So I'm, I'm not talking outside of my neck, I'm talking from experience. Mm -hmm. The only thing to limit you or us from being what we want to be is our own thinking. Mm -hmm. The only thing that will limit you from being re recovered is your desire to use. We know that thousands of men, much like ourselves, have recovered. But don't remind him of this after he has been drinking or he may be angry. Nobody want to hear when they drunk. It, they, I know people that recover, they're like uh, slap them in the face. <laughs> Sooner or later, you are likely to find him reading the book once more. Wait until repeated stumbling convinces him that he must act. For the more you hurry him, the longer his recovery may be delayed. I think about my brother Terry, you know, God rest his soul, now he's passed on. But I had like three years going on four years before he came into recovery. But we were users together as a team. For years, all our life, we got out together. So, you know, we had a much of an age difference. So, when I got clean and sober, he had, him and my other brother had, they were passing around a hat, like we passed around a basket. They going to family stuff, passing around a hat. Had a big raffle going on. See how long we gonna be for our relapse. <laughs> <laughs> I got a month. You know what I'm saying? They, 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 they be doing their thing, right? So I found out about it. And I that did it. That was I no, they not gonna win this bet. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I ain't gonna let them win this one. No way. <laughs> I'm gonna be the last one to stop of the family. I was already that. I wasn't gonna return to it. So I'll beat them. It took him, I gave him a book, and he lost and I gave him another book. I never tried to drag him to meetings, nothing. I just continued a sober life. If I bought something, he fixed it, because he was a carpenter. I got this company, he came over here, and he fixed it. He fixed it. All of a sudden, his life just kept sparing out of control, sparing out of control. The one guy, we had a guy come up here, and they were doing construction work together. My brother stole his tools and sold it. <laughs> So to make a long story short, he finally hit rock bottom, and he came in his recovery, and he stayed sober till he died, like 10, 12 years. But I did not put no pressure on him. And he did he, uh, a remarkable things. I remember, as you can ask Ken, when we were, uh, we were in a transition coming from this building to another building and back to this building, and none of us, there were like 15 of us, had no job. Closed down, we just had our merchandise, we were waiting to occupy. Closed out for about a month maybe. We know that he hired all of us and gave us all a paycheck every week. Hmm. And paid all our bills. Mm -hmm. Now not one person missed one bill. 
He had a big imagination. All right. But had I forced him into recovery, it probably never would have worked. The next one. If you have a number three husband, you may be in luck. Being certain he wants to stop, you can go to him with this volume as joyfully as though you had struck oil. He may not share your enthusiasm, but he is practically sure to read the book, and he may go for the program at once. If he does, if he does not, you will probably not have to have long to wait. Again, you should not crowd him. Let him decide for himself. Cheerfully see him through his sprees. Talk about his condition or this book only when he raises the issue. In some cases, it may be better to let someone outside the family present the book. They can urge action without arousing hostility. If your husband is otherwise a normal individual, your chances are good at this stage. All right, let's, I'm going to quickly go back on page 109. You don't have to go there. I just want to read number three. This husband has gone much further than husband number two. But once like number two, he became worse. His friends have slipped away from, slipped away. His home is in a near wreck. He cannot hold a position. Maybe the doctor has been called in and the weary round of sanitariums and hospitals has begun. He admits he cannot drink like other people, but does not see why. He clings to the notion that he will yet find a way to do so, that continue to drink without being harmed. He may have come to the point where he desperately wants to stop, but cannot. His case presents additional questions which we shall try to answer for you. You can be quite hopeful of a situation like this. All of us in here was like this. We got to the bitter end, we really wanted to stop, but we couldn't. But at the same time, we're holding on to this obsession mm -hmm. that we're going to be able to drink normally again. We're going to be able to use some small amounts and moderate, but continue to get this new job, get this house, and rebuild our life. That's how we thought. But at the end of the day, it wasn't happening. All right? So, what we do now is we take all of this in consideration and we go back to the right here where it says on page 113, if you have husband number three, you may be in luck. Being certain he wants to stop, you can go with him. Is that my, my right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. You can go to him with this volume as joyfully as though you had struck oil. You can, if you got a husband that really want to quit and he get to a hit rock bottom and say he want to quit or a person like that, you can really give him this book and be happy about it because he's at that prime time. You know what I'm trying to say? That point where he can make a decision whether he want to continue to use or get some help. All right. He may not share your enthusiasm, but he is practically sure to read the book and he may go for the program at once. Some people at this point go to the program at once. When I hit rock bottom, my next door neighbor to my mother's house, his name is Joe, Joe J. He was a recovering alcoholic, had about 10 years when I got training, so he gave me the book. When I went over there and talked to him, he said, well, you know, he wasn't a big sheriff. He was a big book thumb. He said, I can take two meetings and all that, but I want to give you something. He brought me the book. He said, read it. And I started reading it before I got to the treatment center. All right. He says that, but I read it all in three days, so I thought I was playing this over. I don't need it. <laughs> <laughs> <You know? laughs> he said, uh, if he does not want the program right away, you will probably not have long to wait. Again, you should not crowd him. Let him decide for himself. Cheerfully see him through more sprees. Talk about his condition or this book only when he raises the issue. If someone talks about the book or the program, then you talk to him about it, all right? In some cases, it may be better to let someone outside the family present the book. If you got somebody, I'm like working with others now. If you got somebody and they're a family member or something like that, and you think they got resentments against you or angry with you, let someone else give them the book. Like another member of AA, you know what I mean? It said, they urge, 
they can urge action without arousing hostility. They can come up there and talk to them about the program, but they're not going to get mad at them like they would a spouse. All right. If your husband, if your husband is otherwise a normal individual, your chances are good at this stage. And I like that if he otherwise is normal. Some people just ain't normal. Bad intention all the way across the board. I don't met a lot of them coming here. They ain't normal worth nothing. And I can honestly say that. You know, got bad intention on the day they step in the program. I wanted to get to a point, but we'll talk about it next week. Just keep this in mind. The disease of addiction isolates us from ourselves first. We start withdrawing from the things that we normally like to do. Then we start withdrawing from family. Can you follow me with that? Then we kind of withdraw. We kind of withdraw from. Uh, we, we kind of withdraw from, you know, family, friends. We withdraw from the work society. We withdraw from education. We withdraw from bill collectors. We start to start backing out of life. We walk all the way out of life until we outside. Life is in there. I'm out here. And I'm peeking through the door looking at other people live. <laughs> People go by me like it's uh, like I'm like you ever sit on a homeless bench or sit out at the bus stop and life is going by you and you look and people look, walking by you like you don't exist like you cat for the friendly ghost or something <laughs> <laughs> like you don't mean nothing to society. That's what happens when you are in addiction. Recovery is coming back into life. When we say being a productive member of society, we're not just saying that to just say some words. We're talking about taking some action so you can rejoin back into the life. Rejoin back into your family. Come back into the existence of the world. Be able to pay taxes. Be able to buy a home. Be able to buy some furniture from the dress store. <laughs> you know, be able to get a key. Be able to get an education. Be able to live happy, joyous, and free. Thank y'all for a good meeting. Okay.